This video is going to be a little bit of a departure from the way that I normally make videos because this will be the first video that I've made that actually has my voice in it. And the reason that I've chosen to do that is because I went into this project thinking that it would be easy <laughs> and that I wouldn't have any issues, not terribly anyway. Um, I've always been pretty good at judging my own abilities in terms of what I can do for projects, specifically woodworking, but anything really. Um, but this project was through curveball after curveball after curveball at me, and it was such a learning experience, such a humbling experience that I felt like voice recording was necessary just to explain the experience. When I first started this project, I was not planning on having a recording. I was planning on doing it like any of my other videos and presenting it on YouTube in such a way that made it seem like I knew what I was doing the entire time. Like <laughs> most YouTubers do, even though they don't. I realized, however, that I was going to have to humble myself because I just made too many mistakes to pretend that I knew what I was doing. So, I'm putting this on YouTube in hopes that other people can learn from my mistakes, if you are wise enough to do so. So, this project was not originally started by me. As you could see, the boards had already been um, planed down, at least I thought. Um, the project was started by somebody else, um, and he ran out of time, or got busy with life and just didn't have the time to finish this project like he wanted to, so they asked me if I'd be able to step in and finish it for them. And I agreed, and my first mistake was believing that the boards were planed down to the same thickness because they were not. Um, I found out later on in this project that on one corner of the table the boards were about a quarter inch, it was an inch and three quarters, and the other end of the table the boards were an inch and a half in thickness. So a quarter inch of a difference. I should have double checked that myself, but I didn't, and it led to a bunch of problems later on that you will see. So with all that being said, let me try to catch up to what's happened in the video so far. Um, I cleared out all of the dead wood from the, from the cedar planks, them being old cedar. There was a lot of wormholes and just rotten wood in them. I needed to, re to remove all of that because I didn't want to be pouring any resin into like divots with dead wood and then the, the resin just pop out because it's only attached to dead wood. And then when I tried to put the boards in the frame, I realized that the ends were not straight. So I had to draw a line from a straight edge, and you see me now cutting the boards, the length, the end of them off. And now you can see it sits flat up against my guide there. And now I'm cutting the ends off the other side as well. And actually, a couple of these boards on the end were warped upwards. I don't have a good picture of that to show you. But I wound up having to clamp the boards down, like, very tightly to the table. And the, um, the client didn't care about what the underside of the table looked like, so they were fine with me drilling uh, screws up into the planks to hold it down during the pour. So, most of the table had screws holding it down. You now see me assembling the frame that will hold the resin as I pour it uh, into the crevices of the table. Um, the 
tape that you saw me putting on the plywood, that's Kydex tape, it's, the resin doesn't stick to it, so I should be able to pour the resin in and then uh, the table will just pop out freely without sticking to the tape. I'm putting the tape on the walls as well. The walls might have not stuck to the resin, but I just wanted to make sure. And then here I saw that the board was warped uh, on the end, so there was a, a divot in the middle. So I plane uh, both ends of the table a couple of times, and then I go through one last time all the way across the table to flatten it out because I don't have a joiner. Sadly, a joiner would have made things much easier, and so would a planer. Uh, planer would have been absolutely amazing on this project, but I made do. Here you can see me caulking up the seams where the boards meet, just to make sure that no resin leaks out uh, when you do the pour. Uh, so this is the second resin table that I've made. I've made a coffee table before, and it was much smaller. That's why I assumed I'd be fine to do this one. But this table is 4 foot by 10 foot. A huge table. Um, way bigger than the coffee table that I'd done in the past. So, one of the worst things that could happen when you're making a resin table is you don't have everything sealed properly, and then the resin starts to leak out of your mold. And once that starts to happen, it's very hard to stop it. So you want to make sure everything is sealed up perfectly, and even though I did that on this table, I still had leaks. So I recommend keeping a caulk gun or some putty or something nearby that you can try to plug up leaks with, but to be honest, it's very hard to stop leaks. You want to do as good of a job as you can to prevent them from ever even happening. So now you see I'm mixing up a small batch of resin without any pigment in it. It's just clear resin. And the purpose of this is to be brushed on the live edge of the wood and into any of the little uh, holes that I'm going to be pouring resin into. Um, the purpose of this, it does a couple of things. One, depending on what kind of pigment you use, if you don't do this, the pigment could seep into the wood and stain it. And you probably don't want that. You just want the pigment to stay in the hole that you put it in. Um, the other thing brushing this coat on does is prevent little air pockets from forming in your main flood coat whenever you do do the deep pour of resin. Despite my best efforts though, I did still manage to get air bubbles. You'll see some of those later on, and those are very hard to get rid of. They've got a habit of, you'll, you can try to come by and touch them up with some clear resin, um, and that works to a point, especially on the bigger bubbles, they're easy to fill in, but the small bubbles are very hard to get resin to actually go into. Unless you maybe had, like, a syringe that you could inject resin into the tiny bubbles with. But just using the pipettes like I was using, it was very hard to get the resin in to go into the little air bubbles. Um, there you saw I was using the wire wheel on the live edge. That's just to make sure it's roughed up after I put the resin on uh, to make the flood coat stick better to the clear coat of resin that I put on. And here is my beautiful wife helping me with this project some. Um, I think by the end of this project, she was more ready for it to be done than I was. Uh, this project took a long time. Like, I work full-time, so I wasn't working on this constantly, but I had been working on this project in a lot of my free time for about five months, I think. And my wife was ready to just have me back at home. <laughs> 
now you can see what I was talking about earlier where I had to clamp the ends of the boards down from where they were warped up so badly and I screwed up from the bottom side of the table to pull the boards down and also make sure they don't float when I pour the flood coat um because like I said the clients didn't care what the bottom side of the table looked like so being able to put screws through the bottom is just the easiest way to make sure everything stays perfectly flat the resin that I used um was a 2 to 1 ratio so I used 2 gallons of part A and 1 gallon of part B in this mix and I used one full packet of pigment it just happened to work out perfectly that to achieve the amount of translucency versus opaqueness that the client wanted it worked out to be conveniently one full package of that powdered pigment So here I use the mixing paddle uh, that goes in the drill. I mixed it for a good seven-ish minutes probably. Generally the rule of thumb that anyone will tell you when you're doing any kind of resin mix is mix it until you know it's mixed well enough and then mix it some more. So that's what I did. Uh, make sure to scrape the sides, I did that. And here's everyone's favorite part, and the part that made me absolutely terrified. Remember when I said that the boards were not all planed to the same thickness, even though I thought they were? This is the part where that really messed me up. You'll see that there are several places in this table that are severely underfilled with resin and then at the same time there's other places that are overflowing with resin and it's not because I didn't level it I spent probably a good couple of hours making sure the table was perfectly level it wasn't a matter of me not having it level it was a matter of the boards were not quite perfect enough for this and I made the mistake of not checking that beforehand If you remember how I said that I had made a resin table before, a small coffee table, that was made out of black walnut. And some of the mistakes that I made on this table were assuming that cedar would behave the same way that black walnut does, and it does not. Um, one example of that is there are many, many, many holes and cavities all throughout this board and something that took a long time is several of these cavities I would fill up with resin and it would all just disappear and I'd fill it up again and it would all just disappear again and I would spend hours sometimes because sometimes the holes would be tiny I'd have to fill them up with a pipette and I'd be sitting there for hours just filling up this hole with the pipette until eventually I managed to fill it all the way up. But I wanted to make sure that any big cavities like that were filled anyway, so it had to be done. And here you can see some of the bubbles that came to the surface. They can be cleared away with the torch pretty easily. Now I'm just going through with more uh, colored resin and doing some touch-up work. And here's another mistake I made. Uh, I don't know if it's that I got to the resin too late. Um, this resin took, I'd guess, about 18 hours to get to this point of solidity. Um, 
and I didn't think it would take that long, um, which is why I got to it a little bit late, I believe. You can see it's a little bit more gummy than I think it needed to be, and that caused a couple of uh, air bubbles to form, like little black dots. You don't see an air like cavity, but you see little darker dots in some pieces of the resin from where I think I folded the resin on top of itself because it had become too uh, tacky at that point. I would have ideally come to it a little bit, like an hour, maybe two hours earlier, but I had already gotten to that table at, I think, 4 a.m. To, <laughs> to do what I had done, and I still had to go to work right after that, and it just wasn't a good... It was a perfect storm of bad timing. If you look in these upcoming shots, you'll see the places on the table where it's very underfilled and obviously there in the middle where the resin has completely overflowed over top of the wood. That is not ideal, but again, the boards were not as perfect as they needed to be for something like this. Here I'm just trying to be very careful popping the table up. I'm using shims, hammering them in all the way around the table. I'm going to leave the table there. I'm not moving it anywhere yet. I just wanted to make sure I could get it up off the uh, the base and that it hadn't stuck to the tape, and it did not. If you look closely in these shots, you can see the difference in the height of one corner of the table and the other side. It's a, about a quarter of an inch difference. Um, so what I'm doing is I set up some guides along the edge of the table I didn't want to use boards, I wanted to make sure it was something straighter than that, because this is a 10 foot long table. Um, so I found some aluminum uh, decking boards, actually. They're aluminum. I clamped them to the sides of the table, perfectly straight, spent a very long time making sure they were perfectly straight, and we used this router jig setup to just make a thousand passes back and forth across the table until I had routed out all to as flat as I was comfortable with. Obviously, if I had access to a four foot wide planer, I would have done that every day of the week. There's no reason I would have chosen to do this over a four foot planer, other than I don't have $40,000 to spend on a planer of that size, nor is there any maker space around here that I could use. So I may do, and I made it work. Here's a little mistake I made with the router. I decided the best way to hide this mistake was to pretend it was another wormhole or something of the sort. So I just kind of dug it out into a more natural looking shape. I wire wheeled it out and then I filled it with resin. Clients are none the wiser. Here I'm just going over the low spots in the resin where the resin didn't fill all the way up. I'm scuffing up the shiny uh, surface with the wire wheel in order to get the next layer of clear resin that I put on to stick better. And there were a few sections like this that were underfilled on the edge of the table. I simply made a, a dam of sorts out of tape to hold the resin back. <laughs> 
and then some shallow sections in the middle of the table that were underfilled. I circled the perimeter of them with a caulk gun to also make a dam of sorts to hold any resin in place. And it worked pretty well. It didn't stain the table. It held the resin in place. It didn't really leak. Um, I'm happy with how that worked. These shiny lines here are little chips of resin that shot out whenever I went over uh, the resin sections with the router when I was uh, planing down, quote, planing down the table. Um, the passes back and forth thing. In a couple places knocked out little chips of resin and I just went back in with clear resin. I, all of the places that were underfilled that already had the blue resin, I just filled back in with clear resin because I didn't want I didn't want any contradictory like swirl patterns to show up. So I just used clear resin on top of the underfilled sections and it worked very well. You can't tell that it's clear sitting on top of colored. It looks perfect. These are the tiny little air bubbles that form on the edge of the wood that I was talking about earlier. I tried going over them with a pipette and resin and like I said earlier, it didn't really work all that well. You can go in with like a needle after you put some resin on top and get like kind of poke the resin down into the tiny, tiny holes, but it, it really doesn't work all that well. You need to do as good of a job as you can sealing off the edges before you put any resin down. Here I scraped off most of the caulk with a chisel, and then after that I proceeded to do a very rough sanding of the entire top of the table. Now remember how I said that a lot of the mistakes that I made on this table were assuming that cedar would behave the same way that walnut did? Yeah. This is one of those mistakes. I started off with 60 grit sandpaper which is far too aggressive to use on such a soft wood like cedar. Um, when I've used it on something like black walnut in the past, it hasn't mattered that much. But what wound up happening using a grit that aggressive with the cedar table is any of the hard sections of the table, so like knots or especially the resin. The resin was substantially harder than the cedar, than the soft cedar wood itself. So that wound up creating high spots where the resin was and low spots where the wood was because the wood would just get sanded away so much faster than the resin. That was the one mistake that probably cost me the most time and pain trying to fix it. As you saw, I tried using the belt sander briefly, and it did work to flatten it out some, but it was far too aggressive. Even using finer grits on the belt sander, it was still messing up the table because the edges of the belt sander would leave deep scratches of the wood. So I tried asking the internet for other suggestions to help fix the low sections and high sections of this table, the problem that I was having. And one suggestion that I kept running across was to literally glue sandpaper to a flat piece of board and use that to sand the table. So I tried it and that didn't really work for me either. The only tool, the absolute only tool I could try to use to fix the, the high spots and the low spots were these little hand-powered drywall sanders. So me and my wife, mostly me, she hates sanding spent days upon days upon days sanding this table. <laughs> 
with these drywall sanders by hand. And it worked. It's flat now, but man, was it labor intensive. On that edge and on this end grain here, I tried using a planer to cut away the excess um, resin that gets inevitably on the end of the wood. And it worked okay, but I tried another method using a straight edge and a circular saw. Here it is here, and it worked substantially better for keeping a perfectly straight line than trying to plane it by hand did. Here I accidentally chipped this knot, so I'm just filling that back in with resin. And more sanding. Here I'm using a router to put a very, very tiny bevel all the way around the top and bottom edge of the table. And here's a before and after shot of the bevel. Now that I finally got the top of the table sanded flat and before I started progressing through finer and finer sanding grits I decided to flip the table over and do the bottom. I started with the belt sander and then just use a palm sander. Like I said before, the clients didn't really care about what the bottom side of the table looked like, so I just did it very rough. I think I only sanded it to 180, maybe, and then just put a quick coat of Odie's oil on the bottom. And here I'm marking out where I'm going to be putting the C channels in the table. I wound up using three C channels. They weren't super thick. Because the table is only an inch and a half thick, I couldn't use the more skookum C-channels. And it probably wasn't necessary, but these channels that I routed out for the C-channels to go in, I went ahead and put some more resin in them as well. Not fill them up, but just coat the wood in resin to, I don't know, add strength. I was just being extra careful. Here I'm using a piece of tape to mark the depth that I need to drill to for the screws. And then, I don't know if this was necessary, it might not have done anything, but I dipped all the screws in, and my finger a little bit. I dipped all the screws in resin before I drilled them into the table. And you really don't want to bear down on these, just snug is all you need, because the C-channel, you want the wood to be able to move back and forth in the C-channel, and the washer helps with that too. Originally the client wanted me to make wooden legs, but I think because of the sheer length of time that I was spending on this table, they decided to just order some metal hairpin legs to go on the table. So here I'm marking out where those are going to go while the table's still upside down. And it's not super conventional, but along with the four legs that go in the corners, we decided to put two legs in the middle of the table. Not the middle edge, but in the middle of the table. That way you would have more room for chairs and they'd just be out of the way, but also supporting the table in more than one place. As you can see here, I originally decided to start off with 180, then go to 240, then 320, and then finish with 400 grit sandpaper. Um, but after doing so, I wound up not being completely happy with the finish. Um, 
but unfortunately I didn't realize I wasn't happy with the finish until after I tried putting the Odie's oil on. And let me tell you, it is not easy sanding on top of Odie's oil. You'll see that here in a minute. So this was originally the final 400 grit sanding, but like I said, I decided to go higher later on. And here's yet another mistake I made. When I decided to put the Odie's oil on, I drizzled it onto the table. I had seen people do that in other videos without any issues, but the problem here is because cedar is such a soft wood, the spots where I initially drizzled the Odie's oil onto the table before going over it with a buffer, they stained a much darker color. And I couldn't find a whole lot of good information on online or on the jar about how to fix that, so I wound up contacting Odie's oil. And the gist of what they told me was that I could try putting a second coat on if it's cedar, because cedar is so soft wood, it can probably take more than one coat, like two or three coats. But even if the table is fully saturated with Odie's oil, eventually there's enough oil in the table that it will blend to the rest of the, the dark lines. You can see those dark lines here. Um, eventually, what they're telling me is that the table should wind up matching those lines. So they said there wasn't a need to sand, but like I said, I wasn't happy with the finish anyway, so I decided to sand. And sanding Odie's oil is... Sanding wood already treated with Odie's oil, even a week after the fact, is very difficult because it gums up the sanding pads so quickly, which is why you can see in this shot I just have one of those rubber sandpaper cleaners permanently on me. So now I've progressed through all the sanding again, and instead of stopping at 400, I went all the way up to 800. And since I went ahead and sanded most of the old Odie's oil off, but those dark lines were still there slightly, I decided to use another product that Odie's oil makes called Odie's Super Duper Oil. It's a much thinner consistency. So the hope was that I would be able to brush it in and it would seep down to match the dark lines faster, and that seemed to work pretty well. And just like regular Odie's oil, it has to be buffed on and then buffed off. So I buffed on the one coat of Odie Super Duper oil and then kind of halfway buffed it off because I knew I was going to be coming in with a second coat of regular Odie's oil on top of it. That's what this is here. And this wound up being the final coat before I finished the table. And it did wind up fading to match the rest of the dark lines in the table. So all in all, it came out pretty good. It was just very arduous. And I don't want anyone to think that I'm knocking Odie's Oil as a product. I absolutely love Odie's Oil. It was user error, newbie mistake. I had never used Odie's Oil before. That being said, they could probably use some slightly more detailed instructions than buff on, buff off. Because that's all it says on the jar. After I got all the Odie's oil buffed off and it had a little bit of time to cure, I went ahead with some wax and a wool pad and polished up the rest of the table. It didn't do much to make the wood shine, but it really brought out the shine in the resin. And the very last thing I did was just wipe everything down with a cleaner mint for wood to just give the wood a little bit of a glint to it. And that's pretty much it. I didn't get to record myself putting on the legs, but you can use your imagination. And this is it in the home. Sadly, I don't have any professional lighting or anything to really make it pop. But you can take my word for it. The pictures do not do it justice. It turned out very well.